My name is Ellen Spurtis. I'm a research scientist at Google, where I worked on the development of App Inventor, and a computer science professor at Mills College, where I taught a course using it. At Mills, a lot of the students are interested in social change, so the class I created was called Technology for a Better World. It focused on how information and communication technology is improving life in the developing world. And this is something that was motivating to students and made developing for cell phones a natural application. Now another feature of the class was that it satisfied the quantitative and computational reasoning requirement. And this is a graduation requirement that's easily met by computer science students, but is dreaded by students who are scared of computers and math. So I got an interesting mix of students. Nine of the students were computer science students, either graduate students in our interdisciplinary computer science master's program or undergraduate computer science majors. I got three non-majors who were comfortable with technology and were delighted to take a class where they'd be able to program cell phones. And then there were three students who could be considered a little computer and math phobic, although they were interested in the material. They uh, had been dreading fulfilling this requirement. In one case, a student had such severe learning disabilities related to math, she had been worried about whether she'd even be able to graduate because of this requirement. I began the first class by looking at how cell phones are used and portrayed in the United States. This new scientist issue had just come out and it talked about how smartphone apps are transforming our lives. And it had examples like software to help you find where you could buy medicinal marijuana or figure out what song is playing. So these are applications that some people might find cute or useful, but I think it's inaccurate to say that they're transforming people's lives. In contrast, if you look at the use of mobile phones in other countries, they are transforming people's lives. Information and communication technology has become very important for global development. As this graph shows, the number of mobile phone subscriptions has been soaring in Africa. This is also true of some of the least developed nations worldwide. As this graph shows, the impact of mobile phones can be huge in the least developed countries. When a country's per capita GNP is only a few hundred dollars, a single mobile phone can increase people's income by thousands of dollars. I found this so amazing that I looked into how this could happen. Some examples are that people who run village stores can now order supplies by telephone. Villagers who used to find work by traveling to job sites can now find out about jobs without leaving home. And villagers whose relatives have emigrated can keep in touch with them and find out when remittances have been sent to banking centers. It's really amazing the difference that a single phone can make to people. The first assignment in the class was to have a debate on the best way to help the world's poor. I started with two quotations. One was from Nicholas Negroponte of the One Laptop Per Child Project. He said, kids in the developing world need the newest technology. This is something that Bill Gates has responded to by saying that the world's poorest two billion people desperately need health care, not laptops. I continued to present material that wasn't strictly technical. One topic was foreign aid failures, such as as presented by William Easterly in the book, The White Man's Burden. We also had a number of very interesting guest speakers discussing successful applications of computer science to real world projects. Mike Godwin of Wikipedia spoke to the students although I think they were more excited uh, to meet the inventor of Godwin's Law than about Wikipedia, as much as students use that. Ken Banks of Kwanja.net 
spoke about uh, his group's work leveraging SMS to help nonprofits in Africa. Eric Brewer of UC Berkeley discussed how his team's work on wireless networks was applied to eye clinics in rural India to restore sight to the blind. And Dave Thau, creator of AntWeb, discussed how it and E.O. Wilson's Encyclopedia of Life are being used to support biodiversity. If you can't get guest speakers, there's also a lot of great videos at TED.com, and we watched a number of excerpts of those, too. We had some speakers on user interface design. We looked at artificial intelligence so students would have an idea of what's possible now and in the future to do with computer science. We used some video excerpts from David Stork's documentary, Hal's Legacy. Another topic we looked at was appropriate technology, how relatively low-tech projects have been able to have big benefits, such as play pumps, which enables children to supply their village's water needs by playing on a special merry-go-round. Uh, this also frees girls to go to school, because normally it's girls' jobs to walk miles to fetch water. And this also improved village hygiene, having enough water to be able to wash. Finally, we also looked at assistive technology, such as work allowing eyes-free access to Android phones. Of course, there was also a lot of technical content, which I think my fellow panelists will also speak about. That's the common thread among all of our courses. While the lower division students were learning App Inventor, the upper division students were learning about cloud computing, including how to use Google App Engine and web services through application programmer interfaces, APIs, to build powerful web programs. For the final project, there were mixed teams of lower division and upper division students. The idea was that they would all brainstorm on applications and the lower division students would focus on user interface design and doing the app inventor coding, while the upper division students did the back end work. Uh, all the teams worked really hard and were excited about their projects and came up with nice implementations. In this program, Wadio, the phone detects the location, and then you can request that it get information about radio stations in the area. So right now, the phone is communicating with App Engine, which is making a call to yes.com, which has information about radio stations. Once it's complete, it found 46 stations in this area. You can get a list of what songs they're playing. And if there's one you like, you can click on it and see what the frequency is, what the station is called, and there are some additional options. I gave the students a post survey, and one of the questions was whether the course changed the way the students thought about computer science, and all of them said that it did in slightly different ways. I've indicated students' majors, years, and whether they were among the strong or weak programmers. I'm only showing the results for the non-computer science majors. This intermedia arts senior said it made computer science more tactile by allowing hands-on coding. Another student said it opened her mind to the possibilities of careers in the field. Another said she became aware of computer science's power to change the world with the help of brilliant minds. A student said she already really liked computer science and now she likes it even more and that computer science isn't just numbers. Finally, a psychology major said that she sees that computer science affects more people than she originally thought and is used in almost every field, something that I think we really want to communicate to students. Our goal wasn't to get every student to be a computer science major, but at least to have a better understanding of what computer science is and how it applies to people's lives.
based on my experience, I'd encourage computer science teachers at all levels to include material on the social effects of computer science and on mobile application development because I really believe they've proven effective in motivating students.